Good evening, this is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We're going to continue in our book reading today, The Secret Terrorists by Bill Hughes. We are in Chapter 4, and this one is entitled President Abraham Lincoln. Now, there's going to be some um, harsh things spoken here. I, I actually, I started to record this, and I only got to like line 4 or whatever, and I was like stupefied when I was reading. I had to stop, and this is what you get. Anyway, just to let you know, some of this is hard to hear. It's hard to speak, too, but here we go. In 1856, a runaway slave named Dred Scott had sought to gain freedom in the free state of Kansas. The case was so important that it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The infamous Dred Scott decision was rendered by the fanatical Roman Catholic Judge Taney, the Chief Justice of the United States at that time. The Tawny decision, in a nutshell, was that the Negro had no rights that the white men had to respect. This basically said that the black man was inferior to the white man and had no rights. Abraham Lincoln, as a child, had watched the selling of young black men and women in a small Illinois town. As he and his friend walked past a slave auction, Lincoln turned to his friend and said, Someday, I'm going to hit. I'm going to hit it hard. In November of 1855, Charles Chinaquai, a Catholic priest of Kankakee, Illinois, had been attacked in a series of court cases by the Bishop of Chicago Diocese. Chinaquai had spoken often on the subject of temperance and the evils of liquor. Since many of the priests were alcoholics and most of the others were social drinkers, Chinaquai's talks on temperance were not appreciated. Chinaquai often quoted the Bible in defense of certain positions he held. This greatly inflamed the Catholic Bishop of Chicago against him. In order to silence him, Chinaquai was framed being accused by an immoral priest's female relative of misconduct towards her. Charles Chinaquai's case had been so publicized in the, I believe it's Illinois C Press, that very few lawyers wanted to defend him. They realized that they were not just fighting against a priest in Chicago, they were fighting against the Roman Catholic Church. Charles Chinaquai learned of Abe Lincoln, a very loyal and upright lawyer in Illinois. Chinaquai sent Lincoln a wire asking for his service, and within 20 minutes of Chinaquai's wire, he got a reply that said, Yes, I will defend your life and your honor at the next May term of the court at Urbana, signed A. Lincoln. Chinaquai relates, The time arrived when the sheriff of Kankakee had to drag me again as a criminal and a prisoner to Urbana and deliver me into the hands of the sheriff of that city. I arrived there on the 20th of October with my lawyers, Messer, Osgood, and Paddock, and a dozen witnesses. Mr. Abraham Lincoln had preceded me only by a few minutes from Springfield. Charles Chinaquai, 50 years in the Church of Rome, Chick Publishing, page 273. <clears throat> I'm waiting here, okay. When Charles Chinakai was defended by Abraham Lincoln, we read, He then went on and depicted the career of Father Chinakai, how he had been unjustly persecuted, and in conclusion said, As long as God gives me a heart to feel, a brain to think, or a hand to execute my will, I shall devote it against that power which has attempted to use the machinery of the courts to destroy the rights and character of an American citizen. And this promise made by Abraham Lincoln in his mature years he also kept Burke McCarty, the suppressed truth about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. R.A. Varta, publishing, page 41. Lincoln realized that Chinaquai had been unjustly accused. The night before Chinaquai was to be condemned to prison for a crime he did not commit, an eyewitness who had overheard the plot to destroy Chinaquai came forward and he was saved. Abraham Lincoln made a lot of enemies as a result of the Chinaquai trial. As they left the courtroom, Charles Chinaquai was in tears. Abraham Lincoln asked him, Father Chinaquai, what are you crying for? Dear Mr. Lincoln, I answered, allow me to tell you that the joy I should naturally feel for such a victory is destroyed in my mind by the fear of what it may cost you. There were in the court not less than 10 or 12 Jesuits from Chicago and St. Louis who came to hear my sentence of condemnation to the penitentiary. penitentiary. What troubles my soul just now and draws tears is that it seems to me that I have read your sentence of death in your friends in your in their fiendish eyes 
How many other noble victims have already fallen at their feet? Charles Chinaquai, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, page 280 and 281. Abraham Lincoln, as far back as 1855 and 1856, was already a marked man that Rome sought to destroy. Four years later, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. As he made his way from Illinois to Washington, D.C., he had to pass through the city of Baltimore. He later said to Charles Chinaquai, I am so glad to meet you again. You see that your friends... <coughs> excuse me. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. You see that your friends, the Jesuits, have not yet killed me, but they would have surely done it when I had passed through their most devoted city, Baltimore, had I not passed by incognito a few hours before they expected me. We have proof that the company, which had been selected and organized to murder me, was led by a rapid, I think that it says a rapid, Roman Catholic called Byron. It was almost entirely composed of Roman Catholics. More than that, there were two disguised priests among them to lead the, on, the in, and to lead and encourage them. I saw Mr. Morse, the learned inventor of electric telegraphy. He told me that when he was in Rome not long ago, he found out the proofs of the most formidable conspiracy against this country and all its institutions. It is evident that it is to the intrigues and emissaries of the Pope that we owe, in great part, the horrible civil war which is threatening to cover the country with blood and ruin. I am sorry that Professor Morris had to leave Rome before he could know more about the secret plans of the Jesuits against the liberties and the very extents of this country, existence of this country. Page 292. Twenty men had been hired in Baltimore to assassinate the president-elect on his way to Washington. The leader of this band was an Italian refugee, a barber well-known in Baltimore. Their plan was as follows. When Mr. Lincoln arrived in that city, the assassins were to mix with the crowd and get as near his person as possible and shoot at him with their pistols. It, if he was in a carriage, hand grenades had been prepared, filled with detonating powder, such as orsini used in attempting to assassinate Louis Napoleon. These were to be thrown into the carriage and to make the work of the death doubly sure. Pistols were to be discharged into the vehicle at the same moment. The assassins had a vessel lying ready to conceive to receive them in the harbor. From thence they would be carried to Mobile in the seceded state of Alabama. John Smith died, the Adder's Den, page 113. As an Italian barber well known in Baltimore, a Romanist was to have stabbed him while seated in his carriage when he started from the depot, Burke McCarty, the suppressed truth about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, R. A. Varta Publishing, page 66. Fortunately, the first plot of the Jesuits to kill Lincoln failed, as they sought to take Lincoln's life before he ever reached the White House. While riding on a train, John Wilkes Booth dropped a letter written to him by Charles Selby shortly after the letter was found and delivered to President Lincoln, who, after having read it, wrote the word assassination across it and filed it in his office, where it was found later after his death and was placed in evidence as a court exhibit. Wow, page 131. Here is an excerpt from the letter. Abe must die, and now you can choose your weapons, the cup, the knife, the bullet. The cup failed us once and might again. You know where to find your friends. Your friend, your disguises are so perfect and complete. Strike your home. Strike for your country. Hide your bide your time. But strike sure. Wow. Page 132. This letter was used to help convict Mrs. Mary E. Surratt and some of the other conspirators in the trial of the Lincoln assassination. They wanted to stab him. If that failed, they were to shoot him and blow him up. Those failed, so they tried to poison him. They were the emissaries of the Pope, the Jesuits. John Smith Dye, who was a witness to these events, tells us, It was a dark day in our country's history when an armed guard had to surround the hotel, Willard's, where the chief magistrate had taken temporary lodging to prevent his assassination.
and on the day, March 4th, 1861, of his inauguration, he was escorted by Pennsylvania Avenue escorted up Pennsylvania Avenue in a hollow square of Calvary and the utmost vigilance was exercised by General Scott to prevent this being publicly from him being publicly assassinated on the way to the Capitol to deliver his inaugural address from the East Portico. These were terrible times. John Smith died the Adder's Den, page 135. So now we know who John Smith died was. I did not know this. He witnessed these events. It would be worth reading his book. All right. When you remember the Council of Vienna, Metternich, the Pope, and the Jesuit orders planned to destroy the country, to destroy its freedom about the evil, vicious, oh, and to destroy Protestantism and to kill presidents, what does that tell you? about the evil, vicious, malicious character of the Jesuits. When you remember their attempts on Andrew Jackson's life, the assassination of William Henry Harrison, the assassination of Zachary Taylor, and the attempted assassination of James Buchanan, the attempted assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and then finally his assassination, what does that tell you about the Catholic Church? It shows you that their facade of being a church is just that, a facade. They hide behind a religious mask so they will not be suspected of the many abominations they continually per perpetuate in this country and around the world. May God help us to never have anything to do with this satanic organization. Abraham Lincoln stated, So many plots have already been made against my life that it is a real miracle that they have all failed. When we consider the real majority of them were in the hands of the skillful Roman Catholic murderers, evidently trained by Jesuits, but can we expect that God will make a perpetual expert, no, a perpetual miracle to save my life? I believe not. The Jesuits are so expert in those deeds of blood that Henry IV said it was impossible to escape them, and he became their victim, though he did all that he could, that all that could be done to protect himself. My escape from their hands since the letter of the Pope to Jeff Davies has sharpened the millions of daggers to pierce my breast would be more than a miracle. Wow. Oh. But just as the Lord heard no murmur from the lips of Moses when he told him that he had to die before crossing the Jordan for the sins of his people, so I hope and pray that he will hear no murmur from me when I tell, when I fall, for my nation's sake. The only two favors I ask of the Lord are, first, that I may die for the sacred cause in which I am engaged, and that I am the standard bearer of the rights and liberties of my country. The second favor I ask of God is that my dear son Robert, when I am gone, will be one of those who lift up that flag of liberty which will cover my tomb and will carry it with honor and fidelity to the end of his life as his father did, surrounded by the millions who will be called with him to fight and die for the defense and honor of our country. Charles Chinaquai, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, Chick Publishing, page 302 and 303. Abraham Lincoln understood that his time was near. In the midst of unparalleled success, while in all the bells of the land were ringing with joy, a calamity fell upon us, which overwhelmed the country in consternation and awe. On Friday evening, April 14th, President Lincoln attended Ford's Theater in Washington. He was sitting quietly in his box, listening to the drama, when a man entered the door of the lobby leading to the box. Closing the door behind him, drawing near to the president, he drew from his pocket a small pistol and shot him in the back of the head. As the president fell senseless and mortally wounded, and the shriek of his wife, who was seated at his side, pierced every ear, the assassin leaped from the box, a perpendicular height of nine feet, and as he rushed across the stage, bareheaded, brandished a dagger, exclaiming, Sic Semper Tyrannus, and disappeared behind the side scenes. Page 307 and 308. 
Noble Abraham, true descendant of the father of the faithful, honest in every trust, humble as a child, tender-hearted as a woman, who could not bear to injure even his most vehemented foes, who in the hour of triumph was saddened, lest the feelings of his adversaries should be wounded by their defeat with charity for all, malice towards none, endowed with common sense, intelligence never surpassed, and with power of intellect, which enabled him to grapple with the most gigantic opponents in debate, developing abilities as a statesman, which won the gratitude of his country and the admiration of the world, and with graces and amenably, which drew to him all generous hearts, dies by the bullet of the assassin. But who was that assassin? Booth was nothing but the tool of the Jesuits. It was Rome who directed his arm after corrupting his heart and damning his soul. Page 308. And after 20 years of constant and most difficult researches, I come fearlessly today before the American people to say and prove that the president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated by the priests and the Jesuits of Rome. In the book of the testimonies given in the prosecution of the assassination of Lincoln, published by Ben Pittman, and in the two volumes of the trial of John Surratt in 1867, we have the legal and irrefutable proof that the plot of the assassins of Lincoln was matured, if not started, in the house of Mary Surratt, 561 H Street, Washington, D.C. The sworn testimonies show that it was the common rendezvous of the priests of Washington. What does the presence of so many priests in that house reveal to the world? No man of common sense who knows anything about the priests of Rome can doubt that they were the advisors, the counselors, the very soul of that internal plot. Those priests who were the personal friends and the father confessors of Booth, John Surratt, Mrs. and Miss Surratt, going on particular could not be constantly there without knowing what was going on, particularly when we know that every one of those priests was a rabid rebel in heart. Every one of those priests knowing that his infallible Pope had called Jeff Davies his dear son and had taken the Southern Confederacy under his protection, was bound to believe that the most holy thing a man could do was to fight for the Southern cause by destroying those who were its enemies. Read the history of the assassination of Admiral Colony, Henry III, Henry IV, and William the Tackertum by the hired assassins of the Jesuits. Compare them with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and you will find that one resembles the other like two drops of water. You will understand that they all come from the same source. Rome, page 309. That arch rebel Jeff Davies could give the money, but the Jesuits alone could select the assassins, train them, and show them a crown of glory in heaven if they would kill the author of the bloodshed, the famous renegade and apostate the enemy of the Pope and the Church, Lincoln. Who does not see the lessons given by the Jesuits to Booth in their daily intercourse in Mary Surratt's house when, when he reads those lines written by Booth a few hours before his death? I can never repent. God made me the instrument of his punishment. Compare these words with the doctrines and principles taught by the councils the decrees of the Pope and the laws of Holy Inquisition, and you will find that the sentiments and belief of Booth flow from those principles as the river flows from its source. And that pious Miss Stuart Surratt, who the very next day after the murder of Lincoln said without being rebuked, in the presence of several other witnesses, the death of Abraham Lincoln is no more than the death of any nigger in the army. Where did she get that maxim, if not from her church? Had not that church recently proclaimed, through the devoted Roman Catholic Judge Tawney and his Dred Scott decision, the Negroes have no right which the white is bound to respect. 
by bringing the president on a level with the lowest nigger, Rome was saying that he had no right even to his life. Page 310. Right after Lincoln's death, John Surratt, who was part of the assassination conspiracy, fled to Montreal. From Montreal, he was taken to Liverpool, England, and then to Rome. When in the United States official, finally, when a new United States official finally caught up with him, he was found in the Pope's personal army. A conspirator in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a member of the Pope's personal army. Three or four hours before Lincoln was murdered in Washington, the 14th of April, 1865, that murder was not only known by someone, but it was circulated and talked of in the streets and in the houses of the priestly and Romanish town of St. Joseph's, Minnesota. The fact is undeniable. The testimonies are unchallengeable that there was no rail, railroad nor any telegraph communications nearer than 40 or 80 miles from St. Joseph. Mr. Lineman, who is a Roman Catholic, tells us that though he heard this from many of his from many in his store and in the streets, he does not remember the name of a single one who told him that. But if the memory of Mr. Lineman was so deficient on that subject, we can help him and tell him what was said with mathematical accuracy. The priests of St. Joseph were often visiting Washington and boarding probably at Mrs. Surratt's. Those priests of Washington were in daily communication with their co-rebel priests of St. Joseph. They were their intimate friends. There was no secret among them. The details of the murder as the day selected for its commission were as well known among the priests of St. Joseph as it were among those of Washington. How could the priests conceal such a joyful event from their bosom friend, Mr. Lineman? He was their confidential man. He was their proprietor, their provider, no, purveyor. He was their right-hand man among the faithful of St. Joseph. The priest of Rome knew and circulated the death of Lincoln four hours before its occurrence in the Roman Catholic town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. Pages 316 and 317. There is so much more material. In the trial of John Surratt, a French minister by the name of Rufus King stated this, I believe that he, John Surratt, is protected by the clergy and that the murder is the result of a deep laid plot, not only against the life of President Lincoln, but against the existence of this republic, as we are aware that the priesthood and royalty are and always have been opposed to liberty. Burke McCarty, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassins of Abraham Lincoln, Ara Varta Publishing, page 185. For four people was tried, convicted, and executed by hanging for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Their names are, or were, Davy Harold, Louis Payne, George Adderzot, and Mary E. Surratt. They were all Roman Catholics. The information is in Ford's Theater. In several glass cases showing many things about Lincoln and the Civil War and his assassination, as Abraham Lincoln was being assassinated, an attempt was also made to assassinate William Seward, the Secretary of State. There was also to be an attempt on the life of Ulysses S. Grant, but Grant had to take an emergency trip to New Jersey to be at the bedside of a dying relative, Andrew Johnson. The vice president of the United States was also to be assassinated at this time. The man who was to kill him became sacred, scared and ran off, riding on a horse into the country and did not carry out his part of the plan. Louis Payne, known as the Florida Boy, an athletic young giant who some months before had joined the conspiracy, rode up to the front of the residence of the Secretary of State, William Seward. William Seward had been ill for three weeks, suffering from a fractured jaw, the result of the running away of his team and was under the constant care of male nurses. Payne rang the doorbell and it was answered by the colored butler. He told the later, no, he told the latter that he had been sent with some medicine which he must take to the sick room. The butler refused to allow him to enter, saying that he had orders to allow no one to Mr. Seward's room. The stranger 
Louis Payne, after a short struggle, knocked him down and went bounding up the stairs. He rushed into the sick chamber after falling, after felling each other of the two sons of the secretary. He, Louis Payne, then sprang upon the sick man and seriously stabbed him three times. By a superhuman effort, the latter struggled out of the bed with his assailant who left him in a heap on the floor, bleeding from the wounds he had inflicted. After his murderous assault on Seward, the ruffian rushed down the stairs, yelling at the top of his voice, I am mad, I am mad, and, a very pro and he pro very probably was. He was entirely under the control of the hypnotic influences of the wicked people whose powers had allowed himself to be. Wow. Page 121 and 122. It was part of the plan that Michael O'Laughlin, one of the conspirators from Baltimore, was to have murdered General Grant that night. This was not possible, owing to the change in the general's plans. To Azardot, it fell to assassinate Vice President Johnson, but he became frightened and spent the day riding into the country on a horse. He was found several days after with relatives of his below Washington. He made a written confession before he was executed, which confirmed the presence of Surratt in Washington that fatal day, a fact which nine reputable witnesses had sworn to. Page 122. Thus we have a conspiracy to kill, not only the president, but to bring the government of the United States completely into chaos. Do we not see the fulfillment of the Council of Vienna and Verona at work in 1865. Do we not see the hand of the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church to destroy this great country? It was an awful time in the history of the United States. We have already seen that the Roman Catholic Church sowed the seed of division between the two great sections of this country, dividing the North from South on the burning question of slavery. That division was her golden opportunity to crush one by the other and reign over the bloody ruins of both a favored long-standing policy. She hoped that the hour of her supreme triumph over this continent was come. She ordered the Emperor of France to be ready with an army in Mexico ready to support the South, and she bade all Roman Catholics to enroll themselves under the banner of slavery by joining themselves to the Dem Democratic Party. Charles Chinaquai, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, Chick Publishing, page 291. Abraham Lincoln said to Charles Chinaquai, I will be forever grateful for the warning words you have addressed to me about the dangers ahead to my life. From Rome, I know they are not imaginary dangers. If I were fighting against a Protestant South as a nation, there would be no danger of assassination. The nations who read the Bible fight bravely on the battlefield, but they do not assassinate their enemies. The Pope and the Jesuits with their infernal inquisition are the only organized powers in the world which have recourse to the dagger of the assassin to murder those who they cannot convince with their arguments or conquer with the sword. Unfortunately, I feel more and more every day that it is not against the Americans of the South alone I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits, and their blind and bloodthirsty slaves. As long as they hope to conquer the North, they will spare me. But the day we rout their enemies, take their cities, and force them to submit, then it is my impression that the Jesuits, who are the principal rulers of the South, will do what they have almost invariably done in the past. The dagger or the pistol will do what the strong hands of the warriors could not achieve. This civil war seems to be nothing but a political affair to those who do not see, as I do, the secret springs of that terrible drama. But it is more a religion, a religious than a civil war. It is Rome who wants to rule and degrade the North as she has ruled and degraded the South from the very day of its discovery. 
There are only few, very few of the southern leaders who are not more or less under the influence of the Jesuits through their wives, family relations, and their friends. Several members of the family of Jeff Davies belongs to the Church of Rome. But it is very certain that in the American people could learn what I know of the fierce hatred of the priests of Rome against our institutions, our schools, our most sacred rights, and our dearly bought liberties. They would drive them away tomorrow from among us, or they would shoot them as traitors. But you are the only one to whom I reveal these sad secrets, for I know that you learned them before me. The history of these last thousand years tell us that wherever the Church of Rome is, not a dagger to pierce the bosom of a free nation. She is a stone to her neck to paralyze her and prevent her advance in the ways of civilization, science, intelligence, happiness, and liberty. Page 294-295 Lincoln said, This war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to Popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. I pity the priests, the bishops, and the monks of Rome in the United States when the people realize that they are in great part responsible for the tears and bloodshed of this war. Pages 296 and 297. You are perfectly correct when you say it was to detach the Roman Catholics who have enrolled themselves in our army. Since the publication of that, the Pope's letter, a great number of them have deserted their banners and turned traitor. It is true also that Meade has remained with us and gained the bloody battle of Gettysburg, but how could he lose it when he was surrounded by such heroes as Howard, Reynolds, Buford, Wadsworth, Cutler, Sycom, Sickles, Hancock, Barnes, etc.? But it is evident that this Romanism superseded his patriotism after the battle. He let the army of Lee escape when he could easily have cut his retreat and forced him to surrender after losing nearly half of his soldiers in the last three days carnage. When Meade was to order and pursue after the battle, a stranger came in haste to the headquarters, and that stranger was a disguised Jesuit. After ten-minute conversation with him, Meade made such arrangements for the pursuit of the enemy that he escaped almost untouched with the loss of only two guns. Page 298. Lincoln said, The common people see and hear the big, noisy wheels of the Southern Confederacy cars. They call them just Davies, Lee, Toombs, Beauregard, Sims, etc. And they honestly think they are the mode of power. The true mode of power is secreted behind the thick walls of the Vatican, the colleges and the schools of the Jesuits, the converts of the nuns, and the confessional boxes of Rome. Page 305. I am fulfilling the councils of Vienna, Verona, and Chittery. The Catholic Church divided the North and the South through their agent, John C. Calhoun. They sought to destroy the economy through Nicholas Vidal, and then they used the poison cup and the assassin's bullet to assassinate and to attempt to assassinate a total of five presidents within a span of 25 years. They read in American soil with the blood of thousands of American young men in the terrible Civil War. Oh, that we had the eyes to see that Rome never changes. What she did, she is still doing today. May God help us to understand the evil of the Roman papacy, then and now. And that concludes chapter four, brothers and sisters. I get so amazed and I get choked up at, at reading these things because there's been so, like I, I've said before, they're changing history. They have changed history. You would not no, unless you've read it yourself, because I, I can't refer it to you. But over a span of time, I have read where Lincoln was actually a Jesuit, not a Jesuit, but he was a Zionist, and he was a traitor, and all of these other, you know, presidents and stuff, they were all wicked. And I'm telling you what, brothers and sisters, not one of them mentions they were only Catholic. 
you know, you know, think about it, you know, just, it's insane, it's insane that they were fighting against the Jesuits, that they were literally killed by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Jesuits. No, it's making them look bad, this new history that they have written. It's ridiculous, it's crazy. Anyway, brothers and sisters, please take this to the Father in prayer. Seek his face. Um, do research. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you to the truth. We don't want lies. We do not want false truths. We do not re want rewritten history. We want the true history. And it's out there, brothers and sisters. It is out there. Now, what I have found, because I've told you before, I really love tangible books. I like to read books. I like to read books. I like to read old books. And you've got, you're going to have to spend the money on some, you, I mean, it, it costs, it costs. And because the thing is, they can't change these older ones, these, you know, uh, what, first copyright, second copyright and things like that. They, they can't change them. So what they're doing is, and I have found this, I don't know if you have found this yet or not, if you've searched it out, but if you search and you're looking for old, old books, you're going to pay hundreds of dollars. I mean, they're on Amazon, you betcha. And if sometimes it is say, um, let's see, out of print or um, out of stock or $12,000, $5,000, $10,000. Prices that you can't afford. And who's going to pay that much on a book? I mean, I'm, I'm a peasant and I can't do that. And so that's why it, it's very hard. But I mean, they're out there. They're out there. Go to thrift stores. Seriously, I'm not even kidding. Secondhand shops. People get rid of things. They don't even know what they own. You know what I mean? I think, oh, it's an old book or whatever. Seriously, I'm not kidding. But search these things. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. He will. I promise you. If you're standing faithful in Christ Jesus, he will. So seek his face. Go to the Lord in prayer. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed the word of God upon the tablets of your heart. So you, so you will not sin against God or be deceived. Till next time, brothers and sisters, stay faithful, look to the Lord, don't look to the left or to the right.